Welcome back to another episode of Lit and Bruised, an Atlanta literary podcast. I'm John Carroll. And I'm Matt Benedictus. Before we jump into this episode, this is the last week to be a part of our giveaway for a big old box of books from Tom Cheshire, Elena Huff Tucker, Jamie Iredale, Molly Brodak, Laura Relier, Blake Butler, Teresa Davis, Carrie Lorick. There's a whole lot more. I don't even want to list it off because it's just that many. But all you got to do to submit to win this whole stack of Atlanta books by people we've had on this season and last season is to leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker. And next week, we're going to go through and we're going to pick someone at random. And that person's going to win all these books. On today's show, we had Kate Whitman from the Atlanta History Center. Kate is a program director and a curator for the Atlanta History Center. And she does all kinds of rad stuff and even more than just those two titles. But we had her on just to discuss their author's program and a bunch of other rad events that they do on a weekly basis over there. So uh, check out the episode. It's really great. And then make sure you scroll down on the blog post and follow the Atlanta History Center on social media so you can stay in touch with them and see what kind of cool events they have going on because there are a lot of them. Whole hell of a lot of them. Yeah, definitely. Well, hope you enjoy the episode. Hey, Matt. Hey, John. Welcome back to another episode of Lit and Bruised. You welcome back. <laughs> I like my voice kind of like got high pitched there. Yeah, it's very positive. Welcome it's like back to another episode of Lit and Bruised. It was more like uh, if you were like trying to sell something. Someone's like, and you'll get this. But wait, there's more. So I was uh, thinking about some books recently. I was thinking about Southern Gothic literature because, you know, we're Southern Mm -hmm. and we both wear black often. So we're kind of gothic. Yeah. So I was, you know, thinking about Southern Gothic literature. And um, have you ever read any? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm a big. You got some classics in you there? I mean, well, of course, I love Flannery O'Connor and uh, like Sanctuary by uh, Faulkner. Uh, That's a good one. Of course, uh, Truman Capote, but most of the really, really big ones, I didn't read that much, but that's because I didn't have that growing up. I discovered them later. Well, that Christian upbringing. Yeah, know, yeah. There was... Uh, kind of painted Christianity and religion into a My My literature corner. was C.S. Lewis. That was it. Yeah, man. It's funny. Like, what you when you grow up with Jesus, um, the kind of books that you end up reading, because... Going to Christian schools, I never read any of the, you know, the the basics, you know, like the Catch-22 and yeah. crap like that. Yeah, I never read those until I was, like, in my 20s. Yeah, I started reading Catch-22 when I was, like, 25, and I was like, I'm too old for this. Because I felt like I felt like it had been perfect when I was in high school, like, angsty and hated my parents, that yeah. kind of thing, you know? But uh, have you ever read Gone with the Wind? I have not. Me neither. I just... I wasn't I, trying to judge you on that. No, no, no. I mean, I just, just really, I get it. I've seen the movie. I've been to the Margaret Mitchell house. Yeah. You know, I, hey, I did, I did an event at the Margaret Mitchell. That's house. true. I, I feel like I'm like one of like 10 people that have done that. If like, if I just died now, it's like, I did an event at the Margaret Mitchell house, put that on my gravestone. But one thing about the Margaret Mitchell house when I was there last time was getting the reminder of how much arson is involved in Atlanta's history. Really? Tell me more. Well, because I was the Lowe's theater. The original Lowe's theater was burned down in relation to Gone with the Wind. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't even know that. It was by a developer. Oh, yes. Yeah. They tried to burn down the Margaret Mitchell house so they could build some sort of skyscraper at some point in time. Yeah. Something about developers in Atlanta. Yeah. Something about developers in Atlanta. They just love to burn shit. You know, they talking about gentrification, which is definitely not the point of this episode, but it's, (laughs) I, I wrote some Atlanta history articles back in, uh, you know, 10, 2000, like 11 and 12. And one thing that I realized though, was that, developers in the 60s love to tear down Atlanta landmarks you know we had the Ponce de Leon ballpark oh yeah and there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of blues clubs and theaters up on DeKalb Ave Decatur Street 
and they just tore that shit down, you know? And then I would, I would Google the address of these buildings that I would come across while doing research for these historic articles. And it would just be like replaced with like some like boring office building, you know, and they would destroy like our history for that shit. You know, is writing about gentrification now the new Southern Gothic? It could be. Depends on like the slant of it. Okay. Yeah, if you talk about it like being like this dark and evil thing, you know. I mean, if you got a lot of people talking on porches, I, I would think so. Their houses, the porches that they were sitting on, were going to be destroyed by developers yeah. to build a new like condo building or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so check this out. I was looking up Gone with the Wind. All right. And it is the most. It is this. It is found to be the second favorite book of American readers just behind the bible isn't that crazy it's like the bible and then gone with the wind they do have the same amount of slavery in it I think. yeah slavery and racism and like murder and love <laughs> but, not, but not the kind of love that we like at least that i like according to my hippie books yeah but, just uh, damn love i know man i wish some of the books that are like my favorites could be like the second favorite book behind the bible hey if you could pick any book to be the most read book behind the bible what would it be oh wow that was a good question that is an awesome question i'm so excited that i came up with it uh hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy Ooh, that's a good one can you guess mine is it a hippie book nope not a hippie book (laughs) think about john carroll like 10 years ago i think you're gonna guess it is it the johnny cash book which one the autobiography, uh, Man in Black. Nope. The other one. You were so close. There was two, actually. But you were like, you're on it. Yeah, okay. Cash by Johnny Cash. Oh, Cash by I feel Johnny like Cash. Rob Gordon, High Fidelity right yeah, now. Yeah, that's it's what like, I was thinking of. My favorite book is Cash by Johnny Cash. And, and every time I think of Rob Gordon from High Fidelity, I always think about Mike Johns. Uh, from the transgression. Yeah, but I mean, without the transgression, like, he was just, he is Rob Gordon. He's just like the American version of it. <laughs> Well, I mean, because the original book is British. So, yeah. you know, John Cusack, I guess he was the original American version. But I guess so, yeah. Mike John's close second there. Anyway, a lot of close seconds here. Gone yeah. with the Wind, Mike John's. But, uh, you know, I was talking about Gone with the Wind and Southern mm-hmm. Gothic literature, mainly because of our guest, Kate Whitman. Hi, Kate. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Of course. I'm going to do something awkward and like read about you sure. in front of you. Yay. So if you're not familiar with Kate Whitman, I know Kate because of the Atlanta History Center and actually from doing an event at the Margaret Mitchell House. And also your wonderful, wonderful son was in three volumes of Transgression as little Mike, Michael Darling. So that was all on you. Thank for you sure. for that. For sure. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that he was into it, but I know that it was based on your permission. So, But Kate, I'm going to read this bio because it's pretty awesome and I like it. So Kate Whitman is the VP of Public Programs for the Atlanta History Center and its Midtown Campus, the Margaret Mitchell House, and oversees all programming for both sites. And then the one thing that we really wanted to talk about, though, was that you also curate the author program series, which welcomes over 50 best-selling authors to Atlanta each year. That's amazing. Like what did you create that? Did you make that up from it? Was, was this your idea? Well, there was a, there was a series at both the Margaret Mitchell house and the history center that predates me. Um, but neither of them were vibrant or like in the same like had the kind of, you know, momentum as when I really took over. Um, Yeah, I would say that we that the Margaret Mitchell House tried to be just Southern literature. And I think that puts you in such a box like it really, Mm -hmm. you know, they're like, you wouldn't have been able to host Nick Hornby, whose High Fidelity is one of my favorite books of all time. So I love that. Did did you all hosted him there? We did not. But we I pitched for him, which I wouldn't Mm -hmm. have been able to do if we were just uh, Southern literature. But Leighton and I saw that on our first date. We saw High Fidelity, the movie. Oh, that was our very first date. Full circle 
circle, guys. This is perfect. That is amazing. That's yeah. an interesting first date movie. It, wow. It was, well, and I loved the book so much, and he mm. hadn't read the book, so I was like geeking out the whole movie, <laughs> and he was kind of like, that's yeah, a good movie. I'm like, no, this is like, because that guy is the guy that you want to date, and yet you're kind of like, God, you're annoying. Like, you mm-hmm. just are too, like, snobby and too into your, like, the things that you like, but yeah. I felt like that was a book that I would think I was 20 three when I read that book and it was like an inside to the male mind which was which was fantastic but the sad male mind yeah but kind of the male (laughs) (laughs) it was a little sad but just men who were like super into what they're into and they just really yeah believe in it and are yeah Especially when they get very pretentious about it. Yes. And I was very pretentious. And I think Matt and I both were in our 20s about yeah. music and things that we yeah. did. Like. I have reorganized my vinyl collection for therapeutic reasons. Okay. I I have. I actually got into Google Docs and made like a spreadsheet and all. that was that, But that was in my late 20s, though. I still haven't revisited that yeah. in, my, in my 30s. But... I feel like I really, I understood that character. You yeah, know? well, I think that he, and a lot of people are like this, and I, I've listened to a couple of your podcasts, and like you judge people and what they listen to or what they read, and, and that's, I think, what I try not not to do with the author series mm-hmm. is that we I host, you know, what would be traditionally like chick lit or, you know, really great memoir books about history, political science. Um, I do so many dead white presidents. It would like bore you. to death. <laughs> but, like, but I try not to be judgmental. And I don't only like if I can book my favorite authors, I'm going to do it. But mm-hmm. I try to be really open to having I say different butts in in seats. Like you want as yeah. many yeah. different types of people to come to these There's events so many as different possible, types of books. right? Yeah. But uh, that kind of just makes me wonder what's been uh, an author that you hosted that you didn't think would be something you're into, but you were surprised by. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, well, we hosted Hillbilly Elegy okay. JD Vance last year, and it was a huge success. It was, I mean, twelve hundred people. We did two seatings, like over six hundred people each seating, and that book just kind of it was right after the election that there was mm-hmm. that groundswell of like people wanting to figure out why Trump won, and mm-hmm. and I think that he tried to explain that to people. It was sort of a polarizing event because I'm I'm so liberal, and I feel like he skews a little little conservative but again like it was interesting to hear what he had to say and he's from ohio which Mm -hmm. the three of us all have connections to well west virginia ohio that area yeah and um yeah i felt like it was an important voice to be heard and now i think people hate him so much and hate that book so much but that's somebody that i i liked what he had to say and i found it interesting that's great I think about that often of like hearing other voices and and going back to even to the music thing I realized when I hit about twenty nine thirty that the reality of it was is that I was an asshole. I was just a I was a dick, man. Like I was like, you're judging people on things that make them happy. And I realized that when I was around music or things that I didn't like that other people liked and they were having a good time, like I was just being like the negative Nancy, and I was ruining the fun for everybody. So I took up a new stance in my thirties where. I thought, hey, you know what? If that makes them happy, that is awesome. I don't need to like love it, but I don't have to be mean about it. Right? It's just, hey, I always see it as a uh, what's more productive. Exactly. I mean, that's how I got rid of my whole asshole tendencies. Like, it's more like, yeah, I could make fun of someone for to their face for being really into Fifty Shades of Grey, or I could have a conversation of like, what do you really like about it? Why? Yeah, and then. You know, there's probably some things you can probably bond on whatever those things are. Well, especially if it like gets someone into reading that isn't normally into reading. You know, you think about like the Harry Potter books, like where was that shit when we were kids? I wish Harry Potter had been around because I would have gotten into reading so much earlier because Harry Potter made reading cool. And when I was growing up, I just didn't really think it was that cool. Right. And I would rather be out playing sports or playing in the woods or whatever I was doing at that age. And I, I feel like I would have, I think I would have gotten into it. 
you would know. your so you had really cool parents, but maybe for you, like, would your parents have let you read Harry? Because there's oh, a no. huge backlash about Harry Potter because of its witches and oh, wizards. Not a and, chance. Okay. I wasn't allowed to watch the Smurfs. Yeah. I had to sneak over friends' house to watch He Man. Okay. Yeah. My, yeah. No, so because Harry, yeah, I think no. Harry Potter definitely. I mean, it's kids reading. 800 page books it's yeah. amazing to yeah. see the way that people have reacted and yet there is this backlash from christianity perspective and and it's so weird to me i'm like every books are all imagination you know mm. like they're all about you know dis like put your you know your beliefs so your, yeah imagination. exactly it's so weird i went my husband is super into science fiction and we went to the science fiction museum because i've always been like i'm not that into science fiction and then we went and basically science fiction is anything that is a little bit off of reality and i'm mm-hmm. like oh okay i'm down with science fiction that's yeah. kind of everything so yeah i think well uh, kurt vonnegut when he first started he was considered a science fiction author and Simply because it involved like time travel, right? Yeah, yeah. anything I, like that. I feel yeah. like all of Vonnegut's books were about like ninety percent like a fiction book, and then like he would always add in like a five to ten percent element of sci-fi, right? And I almost consider those as fiction novels with that really kind of focus on like a social commentary. Yeah, mm-hmm. I never really thought of him as being a sci-fi writer, but I read, read a lot of things about him over the years. And I realized that I was like, that's really funny. I just didn't really. So yeah, I mean, and and it probably, I don't know if he was mentioned at the sci-fi museum. He but, might have been. There were yeah. so many people that I was like, Oh yeah, I guess that is science fiction. It's like, yeah, if you just like fuck with the reality, yeah, just a little, little bit. bit. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, and now any not. book that has like time travel isn't considered science fiction. Like the yeah. time traveler's wife was yeah. hugely popular. That's not in the science fiction section. It's in the fiction or the literary fiction section. That I, I dated a girl. It's always bad when I start a, <laughs> like a sentence off with that. I dated a girl. We're going on a trip. Yeah. yeah. yeah we with are. John we're, right now. We're, we're time traveling <laughs> y'all. We're time traveling back almost 10 years ago. And her favorite book was the time traveler's wife. And she, like, I remember one time seeing her and I was like, she was reading it. And I said, I know you love that book and I know you've read it, but how many times have you read it? And she's like, this is like the eighth time. Wow. And I I was, I was blown away. I was like, you've read that book eight times. I haven't read anything eight times. Really? what have you read eight times? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay. I read the New Testament maybe eight times, but I wasn't going to say that until right. you got <laughs> judgy, okay? Yeah, when I was a Christian, I, I believed that I read the New Testament minus Revelation because I didn't care about the doom and gloom. I was was very positive. Still am. And uh, But yeah, I, I believe that I read the gospel at least eight times. Wow. I know. Isn't that weird? I think, I don't know that I've read anything that much. I've seen movies that mm-hmm. much. Ooh, what movie have oh, you seen? Oh, Clue. I've seen Clue like... 50 times. I love that. Did I ever tell you like this, like my dark secret about clue? No, I don't think so. So the first transgression was clue. I've never seen the clue movie. Oh, that is crazy. And I gotta be honest with you. I'm glad that I didn't. So that when we created that event, that I was not skewed any way other than just like the ideas that we had. But I do want to watch the Clue movie. I'm, you know what? I might just watch it tonight. You need to watch it. I feel like I do. I heard it. Isn't there like three different endings? There's as three well? different. And did yeah. Joshua Whitman tell you that? Did no, my I've, son had, I've, you? Had, I've had friends <laughs> tell me over the years about that. <laughs> but I want, I want to, uh, I want to see the Clue movie. I mean, I love the game. Yeah, it is. It's. Fun. Have you seen Clue? Oh the movie yes, Matt? I have. Okay, yeah, it's what, great. Matt, what movie have you seen more than eight times? Mine's going to be so stupid. It's going to be Hitchhikers. No. <laughs> no, no. I have seen that. But, um, my movie that makes me feel good when I'm down is The Shining. I love The Shining. Oh, man. Love that's a great one. The Shining. Love it. I bet I've seen The Shining at least five or six okay. times. I'm mm-hmm. not quite sure if I've hit eight yet. I've seen it a lot, though. Mm-hmm. I love that movie. I love that it's your feel-good movie. <laughs> it's just something about it. I'm sad when Jack dies. I'm yeah. just like, oh, I want more. Have you seen the recut trailer where they make it look like a rom-com? Yeah. Oh That's the best. It's like, me, Jack. And it's just like, hey, I'm Jack. And it's it's all like, it's it, you know, the way they, they cut the trailer it just looks like it's like a fucking rom-com about like a family <laughs> staying in a hotel. 
Have either of you seen Ready Player One yet? No. Because The Shining has a big part of I, that. Someone, yeah. someone I know has seen it, and they mentioned that there's a Shining yeah. bit in it. Is it cool? It is cool. It is cool. I want to yeah. see it. Yeah. I just wish that they would uh, put new movies on Netflix, like, so you don't Netflix. have to leave your house. Exactly. And you know, if and I would understand if you were like on iTunes and you're like, okay, we don't want this this guy to like play this movie for like 20 people. But I would be willing to pay like a decent fee to not leave my house to watch movies. I don't, I love to see new movies and it's kind of fun going to the theater, but I'd rather just watch it at home. You can pause it, go to the bathroom, get a new snack, yeah. order a pizza. You, well, don't have, you don't have people talking. But, you, but see, that's the great part about films is all the unpredictable shit. Yeah. I don't want, I want the unpredictable. Like when you go to a movie. Yeah. And I can't remember which movie this was, but it was at Atlantic Station, and there was a drunk guy in the front, and the entire crowd unified, like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and amazing. if I remember, this was like not even like a like a real bad movie or anything, but like people, the, the vitriol of everyone, and it yeah. was just like, oh. And then when you realized who the person was after the movie, it was like, oh my God, it's a drunk grandpa with his with his grandkids, and like, he can't even walk right. <laughs> you can't I, get that at your home. I no, mean, you can't. But I don't care. You know, it's like, I, I think about that, and um, I like movies to be unpredictable, but I don't want, like, you don't want I don't other want somebody people. to ruin it for yeah. me. Or if I fall asleep while I'm watching it, I can just, like, wake back up and rewind. Like, I went and saw that last Star Wars movie. I think that was the last movie I saw in the theaters, which was around the holidays. And the first 45 minutes were really boring. And I just kind of nodded off. And then I came back around when it got good. And then and the rest of the movie was cool, but I was like, I can't really say if I like the new Star Wars movie because I was asleep for the first 45 minutes of it. So I, I'm like, eh, you know, people start talking about it. And people were very, they're very passionate about Star Wars movies. They, I mean, for real. And I just stopped caring. I'm like, yeah. hey, I'll, I'll go watch them. I right. mean, I like them. They're cool. Yeah. But like, I don't care. It doesn't, how does that really affect your life? It's true. Well, so we have like figured out a life hack, which is Studio Movie Grill, where you can drink while you watch a movie. Yes. So I will take my son to any kid's movie he wants to see because we can have dinner and we can drink. And it's an enjoyable evening for us while he watches like No Meal and Juliet or some bullshit like what that. A, so, and you get yeah. those recliner seats. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's perfect. So. What what theater is this? So it, the AMCs have a lot of bars now, too, but there's yeah. a studio movie girl, which is out by us. And so the menu, the food is great. Like they have great flatbreads and salads. Oh, and man. Yeah, it's like the perfect night out where you don't have to actually interact with your child, which sounds horrible because I love interacting with my child. <laughs> but you can just drink and relax. It's like the perfect Friday night. Like you've had a long week. Here, we're going to take you to see this movie that you're going to like and we're going to drink and it'll be fun. Yeah, he's just into it. Well, that's what I do at the. Uh I hate Atlantic Station, but I go there for the movies, but I go there for the VIP section, oh. which is 21 and up. How do you get into that? Is it just uh, a different ticket? Yeah. It's just okay. a, you just You'll see it when you're buying the no, ticket. No, we've seen that, and we're like, what is that? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, it's like that's $10 this, more per. Okay. And worth it's it? so worth, worth it, it because you end up paying about 25 bucks a pop. Yeah. Like, pretty much. Just, so, it's if, if, if you're on a date... 50 bucks. Right. It's, it's happening. Right. But they have food, which their food's okay. I don't really go for the food, but I go for the fact that it's 21 and up. Mm -hmm. You can't bring a kid in there. Right. And I also factored in the fact that if you're paying $25 for a ticket, you're probably just not going to talk and ruin the movie for right. everybody, which I've been to it like six or seven times. Nobody ever ruins that shit. Nice. No one talks. But and they have a bar. They have a bar. Nice. So you get a drink when you first walk in. You can order some food. Mm-hmm. You sit down, but then if you're like, oh, I got to use the bathroom really quick, you can hit the bathroom and then hit the bar again for another maker's nice. mark and then just make your way back in. It, so it's very similar to your situation, yep. um, but they don't allow kids in. So yeah. your situation sounds even better for yes, you because you're like, oh, perfect for us, put the right. kid in the seat, <laughs> put him in there, just bring me the makers, bring me the pizza. Yeah. Like, it's perfect. He doesn't care. He doesn't. He's, he's, he's happy. It's perfect. Your kid, though, you know, I was thinking, I was like, I don't want to, like, talk about your son because you're... Matt will be like, what? Well, he, he's seen your son in action. So your son... Yeah. So my uh, Michael, Michael Darling, <laughs> that's your son's name, that Joshua, who played Michael Darling for three 
plays that I wrote and produced and all this stuff. It's um he's an he's an interesting child. He is an interesting child. He is child. um I w- I like think back to being his age and I was just a little shit. And and your son is so well behaved and polite and kind and talented. It really um, seems I'd, outgoing in a good way. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah I, really I don't is. know what to do. Or I, like when I look at him and I think about that, I, I would just be like, "Who? What are you?" Oh, that's awesome! It's so funny. So the day after the show, so you know, the last show was a couple a week, a week and two weeks ago, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was about a week. And, and I got yeah, like yeah. four new friend requests on Facebook, all from cast members, because yeah. I think they just don't want to lose like knowing what's happening with Joshua. It's not like they're like, "Oh, Kate is so cool." We want to be friends with her it's like we need to know what's happening in joshua's yeah. life so that's a huge it's the biggest compliment when when adults love your kid like you know it's great that if he has kid friends but it's like adults gravitate towards him in a way that i find really exciting and he just he's just like sweetness and light you know he's just yeah. sweet and funny mm-hmm. and you know yeah the, you know you you do these rehearsals and you know we just did three Peter Pan shows in 12 months, you know, from, from the time 10 we, months, really? Yeah. yeah 10 months 10, in terms yeah. of when they li- when yeah. went live, three but separate. Yeah. Yeah. Three <laughs> separate shows. And I think about there's times when you get cast members who get in bad moods and who do certain things and none of them were your son uh-huh. <laughs> and you're and you're sitting there and you're like man it's interesting that like a uh, like a 7 year old is can hold his emotions <laughs> together better than like the 30 year old that's like on set you know yeah and, it's they people always say like you should never work with children actors and i think he like is not that he's just not that kid he's just he loves it he loves being there and he's He's there for the experience. He has fun. Yeah, he really enjoys. So prior it, so. to the transgression series, had your son done any other acting? He he's, he'd taken like classes mm-hmm. at the Alliance and at Aurora, but he hadn't been in anything other than like the productions that you do for those things. And then he's um he's a dancer, so he's okay. been in three Nutcrackers. All right, and he'll tell you like he'll meet you and be like, "Hi, Matt. I'm Joshua. I've been in three Nutcrackers. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've been in three seasons of the Nutcrackers. So, That's good. Yeah. He's selling his brand. He is. He is. So I mean, and I think we could. People will be like, "Man, you could make so much money off of that kid." And I'm like, "How?" And like, at what? Ex- like, I don't have that kind of time. Like, for us to take him to all these different locations, that was a lot. So such yeah, a jerk to do that. yeah. And I just think if he's into like he loved that experience so much, and I would love to have those opportunities for him. But I'm not going to be like, let's take him out of school and yeah. Have him be Webster, who Emmanuel Lewis didn't turn out so good, everybody. No. So let's not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and I loved Webster. I and did I would too. love to see, you know, Joshua in a remake of Webster. Oh. I think he'd be great. You know, let's put that in the universe. Going into like <laughs> going into a house and sneaking through secret passageways and stuff. But, uh, you know. I I don't know. I loved I loved Webster. It, it was, was such good. a it was such a good show. Do you do y'all remember the episode where Webster got stuck in one of the secret passageways? I what's weird is that I don't, but I had a picture of him. Like so I have always had an affinity for African American mm-hmm. men. And so between Prince and Webster, like when I was six years old, those were my men. Like Prince mm. was the more adult version and yeah. Webster was the I had like a big picture of Webster, yeah. But then you found out that Webster was actually older than Prince. Yes. <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah, you know, I saw Emmanuel Lewis at a basketball game once. He's like around. Like I think yeah, you can see him. Yeah. yeah. I think he went to Clark, Atlanta. Oh, that's and, funny. and one time I was, I was at this basketball game. This is like ten years ago as a Hawks game. And I was walking through the parking lot, and it was dark out, and I walked by this guy, and I looked at my buddy, and I was like, did you see that guy? I was like, what was that? Like, that was weird. He was, like, walking kind of funny. He was really short. And uh, my buddy looks at me and goes, dude, that was Webster. And I was like, nah, that's not that's not Webster. And he's like, dude, it was Webster. And I turned around, and, and uh, Emmanuel Lewis was getting into this gigantic SUV. And I went, hey, Webster. <laughs> And he turned around and he's like, hey! And I was like, holy shit, it's fucking Webster. I just saw Webster like in a parking lot by Phib Serena or Phillips Serena. It was just, uh, it was weird, but it was so, awesome. He was a really nice guy. I mean, those are the little things of Atlanta that are really great. Yeah. Where you I mean, can just run into people and everyone always seems to be very jubilant. 
Yeah, I mean, the fact that, like, I mean, looking back on him, like, that's really shitty that I just yelled Webster at him. But he was into Oh, it. I think he is pretty excited when people recognize yeah, him. That like, would be my, yeah. I guess. mean, I, I, it's on, it's on a streaming show, like, station now, and I watch it sometimes. <sighs> I love that he called his, his like, stepmother or his uh, adopted mother ma'am. He always call her ma'am. I don't know why I like that. I don't know. I never saw Is it. Is that creepy? Is it creepy that I like to watch Webster? <laughs> no, probably. I'm the- interested to know that you like Webster. I did not expect that. Mm-mm. Oh, man. I, love, I loved all that, like, kitschy 80s shit, man. Like, MacGyver. What was Webster's, like, special episode? Every show had, oh. like, their special episode. You mean, like, the like, the... The PSA one? Yeah. Everyone had that one. Well, I feel like the one where he got trapped in one of like the secret rooms was kind of like a PSA. Because mm-hmm. it was like, they were calling the cops and they are all worried. Um, I don't know. I remember the Silver Spoons had like the molestation Oh, one. yeah. Yeah. And then Saved by the Bell had like the... Oh, Jesse when she got on drugs? Yeah. Yes. Like she was so she took excited. Speed. That <laughs> yeah. was the best episode. So, so excited. I'm so scared. <laughs> Dude, that was the greatest thing about the 80s and 90s, man. Those PSA episodes. Do they do so that good. anymore? A very special episode yeah. is what they call it. I think it. life is just a PSA. Now. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> no, now, like, it's reality TV. So you, yeah. like, are watching Intervention, like, which isn't a full PSA for drug use. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's all there now. Didn't didn't Mr. Belvedere have one about AIDS? <laughs> oh, that would be cool if it did. I wonder if it did. I can't remember in my mind. Because there would have is- either been... That would have been admitting that that AIDS wasn't just for gay people, though, because I don't remember there being a gay character on Mr. Belvedere. Yeah, I can't remember if that's real or if that's just a meme that's gone around. We need an assistant that's like on the computer and ready to look stuff up. And we can just be like, Billy, look this up. Is there a PSA episode on Mr. Belvedere about AIDS? And then, and then like 45 seconds later, Billy's like, yup. You know, I'm pretty sure if that's actually a meme that someone will email me about it. Yeah. Mr. Elvedere was so great because he's such a dick. He was. Oh, <laughs> he was that British. Yeah, that British, like, fuck you kids. I'm going to just be straight laced. And yeah, you can do that. I don't care. But who, right. who didn't want a Mr. Belvedere? I wanted a Mr. Belvedere. Well, because that would have implied that you were rich. And I don't know about you two, but I did not grow up rich. I so wasn't rich like, either, yeah. but I still wanted him. Yeah. No, but yeah, so having a, a butler would have meant that you... Yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. Do you all remember that that uh, movie back in the 80s? It was the Richard Pryor movie, The Toy. <gasps> yes. Yeah, yes, that? where he buys Richard. Oh, my God. That movie was so <laughs> good and so horrible. Probably in hindsight, time. that yeah. is probably super fucked up. Now. It's probably really racist if we were oh, going to talk yeah. about I mean, it It was then, I'm sure, too. But, yeah. I loved that movie when I was a kid. And my, we used to go and rent it at Blockbuster yes. like, all the time because it was so funny. Because he was hilarious. He was hilarious. I think there's a scene in it where he gets, like, bit by... I like piranhas he like falls into some piranha like <laughs> river i used to watch it was like the cocaine to- is a hell of a drug yeah. that's how richard Pryor made those movies yeah <laughs> seriously it was like every every other weekend we either watched the toy with richard Pryor or, or labyrinth with david bowie oh so good do you know that they're gonna do a um reboot of overboard the goldie hawn oh, kurt russell my movie God. Yep. Oh, and I'm not going to be able to think of her name. Um, is it, Anna uh, Ferris is going to yes. be, yeah, yeah Goldie Hawn's the, character. That yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, she'll be good. It'll be good. I'm surprised that they and didn't th- get Kate Hudson, though. Mm, get her daughter to play. So, it. Mm. And I think they're doing like a role switch, too. Yeah, they are. They are. We read the same article. Probably. <laughs> You know, as long as no one touches the burbs, I'm okay. Oh, uh, that yeah. was good. What about Money Pit? Do you remember Money, Money Pit? Money Pit's all right. I mean, the laugh, Tom Hanks laugh yeah. when everything falls apart. Who can't relate? So, to have that? you? I'm I'm like a true crime person, and so mm. the is it the East, the Golden State, like killer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So they were basically tr- like tracking that, and they were like, it could have been Tom Hanks. Like there was this like joking theory that like <laughs> man we need to pull up the bosom buddy schedule to see if because he was like in all the places that it was and they're like maybe tom hanks is maybe the golden this state is killer why i've heard tom hanks talk about on podcast how he has major imposter syndrome issues maybe is that what maybe. is that what pat oswald's wife was yes uh, michelle at? yeah mm-hmm. yeah i forget her last name but yeah yeah, that was that book is really good. I just read that book. Yeah, it sounded really interesting. I've kind of followed that from afar, just 
it made me really sad just yeah. because he was so messed up from it, which, you know, rightfully so. Right. Your wife just dies one day in her sleep and she's so passionate about this thing. And um, yeah, I saw that they had released it, though, and it looked really interesting. And it's, I, and it's a bestseller, which has to be really bittersweet because it's selling great and there's been a lot of buzz about it and didn't yeah. he like finish like the last section so the, of it they, he hired two people so basically like her researcher and then another guy that was that is also like a true crime person they they used her notes and all of her mm-hmm. research to write the end of it okay. and there's no I mean for true crime like one of the things that you need is like a resolution and there isn't like they still don't know who the Golden State Killer is and so that's really yeah What's the book called? Golden State. No, like I'll be home after. Yeah, you do. We need. We need that guy. We we, we need need Ricky over there. I think it's called. um, I'll be gone after dark. Is my guess, and if that's right, I'll be really. They didn't check it out. I mean, just just following that was just like very heartbreaking. Oh, he and he's just so lovable, Uh, and you just feel so bad for him, and it's yeah. I think he just got remarried. He did. Did he? Oh, that's great. He must not have been that heartbroken about it. No, he went through his whole thing. But then also, uh, he uh, recently did a uh, stand-up special where he dealt with all that. And it is one of the most wonderfully crafted stand-up special. Because before he gets into, in the middle of the show, he just starts doing crowd work. Okay. And you realize it's not for the crowd. It's for him. He's trying to prepare himself for the next series Mm. that he's about to go into about dealing with his wife. Michelle McNamara was her name, right? Okay. I think. But uh, but then when you watch it and like really watch the way he sets everything up, like he hits like when he's going through the stories, like he hits like he's like, here's a devastating point. Mm. And then he goes into like a moment of brevity. Like he goes on to a side tangent and then he quickly finds a way to pull it back into what he was talking about. And it's almost he did that for the audience and he did that for himself and it's fantastic to watch the mm-hmm. is that on Netflix yeah it was a Netflix oh, cool. special Netflix like owns comedy oh they totally days. do they just like it's just all there yeah you want comedy get a Netflix which is yeah cool. the book was called uh, I'll Be Gone in the Dark so close you were I think close I said after yeah it, right it's good I would highly recommend but I mean I'm a true crime person so I love true yeah crime. Michelle um, Mac- McNamara is her name? McNamara. McNamara. I think, yeah. That's probably right. I mispronounce all last names. So on the true crime front, I mean, are you like true crime everything? Like books, podcasts, TV shows, movies? Yeah. So I'm a murderino. So that's my podcast of choice, which is... Um, Murder Reno? That's what they call people who... My favorite murder is the name of the podcast. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very big. Um, I just saw them live at the Fox and it was funny. So like I'm imagining you guys doing what you do like live on stage. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I can see like people. You'd pull we people, have. and it'd be good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, uh, we appreciate. That. Yeah, I would think it'd be really fun. Um, so that is one. But I like Forty Eight Hours Mystery. Like as a kid, mm-hmm. I loved Unsolved Mysteries. Oh, yeah. I I got, love, I like Robert process. Stack's yeah. voice, just like. I think it turns me on or something. Like, I love his voice. Like, he, You're like, the late, voice I am. Please like, talk, talk Robert like Stack to me. Um, but Unsolved Mysteries and then, like, Dateline and 48 Hours Mysteries and all that. I love that. And then, yeah, reading a little bit, but um, probably not, yeah. not as much. But, yeah, I'm into it. True crime. I mean, that's I'm definitely, you know, true crime and kind of the storytelling podcast, but typically the ones that are creepier, like yeah. the lore and unexplained and those and it's funny that we that we host this kind of podcast because it's not the kind of podcast that I actually listen to. Right. Because I love the stories behind it. I love but I mean Unsolved Mysteries when they started releasing that shit on DVD oh I bought like every box I'm set super of it. jealous that you have it because then yeah. there was like I didn't even know about this but then there's the guy is it Farina, like the guy who was on like NYPD Blue, yeah, he ended up being uh, like the host of it after oh, that. And I, I was like, that. Oh, yeah, no, I don't need you got to go yeah. with the old school ones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I mean, just just hearing the music, it almost like Love makes it. like the hair on the back yes. of your neck stand yeah. up. It's just like that creepy thing. And I watched there was a couple of years ago. I sat there and just watched like a whole box set, and by the end of it, I was like. I didn't turn the whole light on before yeah. I go to bed. You know, it was just creepy. You know, you just watch it. But that, what a great show! I wish, I wish there was something else like that now. 
I, I think mean, the true crime uh, podcast can all fill those voids. Yeah, I'm trying to think yeah. if there's anything. There is so ID, which is like investigation oh, discovery, tries that, to fill yeah. tries to fill that void a little bit. And there is a couple of those shows I think that do. Re- there's actually a new um, series about the Golden State Killer mm-hmm. that That's they've cool. done that is supposed to be really well done. You know, like that doesn't use all the cheesy like reenactments yeah. and yeah, stuff. Definitely. And, yeah, but I think I I think it started for me because of Adam Walsh. He, yeah. When he disappeared, because I was like five or six, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's like the idea of you being at a store with your parent and going mm-hmm. missing, and like our parents became like, "Oh my gosh, you have to be with us all the time." And I think that's what started it for me. Yeah, he actually was. I was about uh, to say, like, you actually have found a way to it's put in, Adam Walsh in a it's couple in of pieces. Slow before. burn. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. So I, a, I had I, no idea this yeah, was not a setup. I wrote a <laughs> uh, my first chapbook that Matt put out was called Slow Burn. In the story, I mention Adam Walsh because I talk about how my parents always were mad at me because I never told them where I was going. And I was born in Florida, which was like less than 100 miles from where Adam Walsh's body was discovered. Mm-hmm. And he was taken less than a year before I was born. So, mm. like, all of my childhood in Florida for eight years of it was my or my parents constantly concerned about me being kidnapped. Right. But I would never tell them where I was yeah. going. Yeah. They'd call the cops. You know, they'd come looking for me. Wow. They, I just wouldn't think about it. Yeah. And, well, because uh, you're, li- you're supposed to be carefree when you're little. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it just carried on. Like, that was the biggest thing that I ever did in, like, my yeah. entire life. My parents were just, like, constantly angry with me because I wouldn't tell them where I was going. I just didn't think about it. Yeah. It just wasn't one of those things. But um, I was curious, though. Do you, have you had any true crime uh, authors uh, for Atlanta history. I ha- not really. I mean, I think um, the closest is there was a biography of, not a biography, there was a book about um, Emmett Till last mm. year, and we hosted the author of that, and that was fantastic. And Emmett Till is like that case where you just think of a young man who did nothing wrong and because of racism and, you know, was lynched, basically. And um, so that, uh, things like that. So things... Um, Hosted Patrick Phillips, who also did a book on lynching in Forsyth County, which I don't know if you guys know anything about Forsyth County, but they had a a ton of lynchings and to the point where all of the African-Americans left there. And it was like in the... the twenties and the thirties, and so and Forsyth in the Oprah it's did really a big scared episode. Going to be like it was, yeah, 10 months ago. no, well, but they Forsyth County hasn't changed that much, and so it's it is. I mean, just how predominant racism is. But the best book I've read that sort of it's fiction, but it's true crime is My Sunshine Away by um, is it Mo Walsh? But it's about a young woman who who dies, like is fifteen years old, and she dies, and they find her body, and so they kind of reconstruct like who could have done it and what. Um, yeah, so I, I I'm morbid and I like all that shit. I should oh. say that my um, my mom's side of the family owned a mortuary, and so okay. I like used to spend my summers like at a funeral home. So maybe that has that's something amazing. To do. <laughs> like. Did- like, what did you do when you would just hang out? Put makeup on dead bodies. Oh, for sure. Wow. You did, did that? that? I did that, yeah. You put makeup on yes. dead bodies. Yes. We, like, were you supposed to? Well, I was with <laughs> I was with the woman who did it. Like, I okay, loved Okay, I just had in my head, like, you're just So, like them. Joshua, I, I liked adults, and I would just, like, be like, hi, and, like, she'd be putting, you know, makeup on dead bodies, and I'd be like, I'll help you, and, yeah, but their house was, it was a living, it was mm-hmm. a living space, but then... The lower level had like the viewing room and it had a casket room and out in the um, garage was where the embalming room was. And yeah. Where is this house? It's in Ardmore, Pennsylvania. Ah, I wish it was in Atlanta. I know. I'm actually looking for a funeral home right now. Oh, to do like a show. Yeah, Mm. I know. I've got ideas. I'm into that. I'll be your stage manager. I'm always intrigued by art that that is created purposely in... uh, Funeral homes or mortuaries. So, like, like art shows or something. Not even art oh, shows. Okay. But people who have like tried to create within those spaces. Interesting. Uh, musically, I think about uh, Nine Inch Nails. The Fragile was mm. recorded in a place that was re- It was originally a mortuary, and then they just basically turned it into a house. But everyone kind of went crazy because the mixing room was the the embalming room. So there was no windows, just total basement, and they're trying to figure out how to craft an album with like 60, 70 songs to work with and create a narrative. 
See, that sounds amazing to me. It does. Well, and it's like this place where, so I have a lot of anxiety and I, mm. and I have had a lot of like anxiety over death. And you would think that I would have this real like, yeah, like a, it's just the way it is because I've seen dead bodies so much and it was just, mm-hmm. but I, I think it's, you like go internalize and I'm like, I'm going to die someday. And I'm, you know, like that anxiety that yeah, you, you just have. Start kind yeah. Of dealing with what you Cause you, change. I probably dealt with it way earlier than most kids deal mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. <laughs> Putting makeup on dead bodies. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I used to think about death a lot, and but my anxiety didn't really kick in until, uh, you know, in my 20s. <clears throat> Excuse me. And But it's funny. I still think about it. I'm like, I'm going to die one day. It's an existential crisis is what my therapist told totally. me. Totally. Yeah. Matt she told me to read Man's Search for Meaning okay. yeah. by Viktor Frankl and to study Buddhism. I, I saw her four times. That those that, that was the that was what I she got. gave you. I read. I read a lot I of got your reading list. list. You're good to go. Exactly. I was this, like, thanks for that. When this season first started, or maybe the last one, it was like in the fall, and it was like John Carroll's having an existential crisis. Mm. I was I was struggling a lot, but uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of those books, positivity, thinking mm, about yeah. it, um, because a lot of people I know they have like a lot, a lot of social anxiety, and that doesn't bother me a bit. Mm-hmm. Put me in a room full right. of people, yeah. I don't give a shit. It's fine. Right. But what freaks me out is the fact that why are all these people here and why are we alive? You know, that was always what weirds me out. And a lot of times when I still think about it probably like once a day, I'm like, why the fuck am I here right now? This is bizarre. And then chaos. Yeah. I mean, it's just insane. And then I'm like, well, I'm just going to turn on the radio, listen to a song and, you know, go, go drink a beer, whatever. It's fine. It's very bizarre. But, you know, if you sit there and think about it long and it feels to kind of drive yourself mad. Right. More so, I the, what I came to is like, hey, you know, we create our own purpose. And I will just be grateful. I'm grateful that I'm here. Yeah. I'm excited that I'm here. I'm so, I'm so thankful that I'm here. That's how I deal with it. Because that's all I got. Because I don't have anything else outside of that. Otherwise, I think I'd just go nuts. Right. I'll probably still go nuts. But. Yeah, I think you probably will. <laughs> But yeah, you'll have man. a hippie book in your hand while you do. Oh, I, love oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I just hope I don't go nuts till I'm like 70 or 80 and I, I'm, I'm like good. I've like done right. all the things yeah. and I'm like, I'm rocking and rolling. And then I'm like, all right, I'm done. I'm just right. going to go like sit in my house and go nuts. Right. That sounds perfect. Yeah. I don't know if perfect's the correct term. Yeah, probably for it. not. It sounds okay. I it's, definitely think you you being hit away from people would be you going nuts. Oh, I'd get crazy. Because I mean, I'm an extrovert, I grab energy off people. Yeah, but you also are kind of obsessed with stockpiling things for Armageddon. I know, I am, aren't I? <laughs> That's odd. Like, what kind of things? Thanks a lot, Matt. Making me yeah. look cra- crazy in front of Kate. I don't stockpile from Ar- for Armageddon. <laughs> I stockpile for uh, minor disasters. You know, I think about things like... You have a like, lot of bottled uh, water. That's a good thing. Yeah. I, have, I have a decent amount of water. Okay. Um, I think about things like Katrina. You know, these people were, were kind of fucked for at least a month, yeah. if not longer, you know. And uh, so. Atlanta's landlocked. I just want to make sure you know. I know, but not, other okay. things okay. could happen. Okay. You know, the CDC is. Do you do that far. too, Matt? You yeah. try to remind him. Like, I'm right. not. Yeah, I'll tell you this. <laughs> I don't, I'm not an ocean person. That's I don't, why I'm here. I don't worry. <laughs> right. But, but you're prepared. If for the I, zombie apocalypse. If, if I couldn't buy. F- not an apocalypse, okay. just. Just something might happen. Yeah. If the lights went out, I could feed myself for two months. I got that going on. That's impressive. That is impressive. And you wouldn't know by looking around my apartment. No, I would not. You know, I have things to make fire and to defend myself. It's fine. I like that. That's this. You have a fake chainsaw that I'm. There is a fake chainsaw. You're the first to ever mention that podcast. Actually, I love that. But yeah, yeah, it looks scary from far away. It does. That's actually how I defend myself. Okay. I just hold that up from far (laughs) away. We're not gonna fuck with that guy. He's got a chainsaw. Well, what I do is I just like ma- I make I, the noise, too. That's kind of like a, I used to be a very angry driver. I mean, I'm still an angry driver. I just keep my windows up so no one knows. Uh, but I used to carry a crowbar in my car. Yes. And I would get into situations where I would pull it out. And nobody fucks with you if you pull a crowbar mm-hmm. out. Because it says you have no mercy yeah. and you're probably <laughs> off your hand. You don't care. Yeah. And when I get angry, my voice cracks like a little kid. So that just added to it. You wouldn't like Love Matt me. when he's angry. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like fully prepared 
But I think if I was, like, rich, I would own, like, a bunker. Yeah. I would totally do that. But it's fine. You know, it's okay. I think everybody kind of feels that way, though. I feel well, like I just it. remember watching, like, Susie Orman and being like, you need to have, like, two months salary. And I'm like, that's never going to be, yeah, like, a totally. thing. Like, yeah. I'm just like, who has savings like that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put it's that like, on the side. So I like hearing that you have supplies because I don't have the financial resources necessary. Yeah, I, I mean, they, if you think about it, so if like the system went down and everything right. was like fucked, I mean, what are you going to trade with? Um, yeah, because so, you were talking about Bitcoin. The other, I was like, who like actually uses Bitcoin? But you are the first person I know that actually... Yeah, I I got some money in there. I like to I just like to spread things around You're, a little bit. You like bit. to diversify. I, I like to diversify. So whether it's stockpiling like ramen noodles in my closet or buying Bitcoin, I'm on it, you know. But I, I do think about that a lot though. I'm like, what would happen if it all like went down? But the one thing that I don't have, which I feel like I should get, is like a whole lot of mini bottles of alcohol mm. and a whole lot of like a that's lot of something to trade with exactly oh, Cart, cartons of cigarettes and yeah. mini bottles because think about it if if currency was gone tomorrow what are you trading with yeah well you don't want to trade your food and if you had like ammo or weapons you don't want to trade that but cigarettes and alcohol man i mean that's what makes the world go around baby you know i mean they're gonna want to trade with that so i think about it sometimes I'm like i wonder where i can just get like a shit ton of mini here's bottles. the thing that gets me about being prepared yeah you, there are way too many contingents to prepare for. I mean, right. I'm, not, I'm not that prepared. But like, okay, uh, currency going down, that's one type of prepared. But I think it's more rational, and it can be different for every person. I think it's more rational to prepare for power being gone forever. Definitely, yeah. It would take one quick solar flare or, I don't know, let's see what. China tried to hack into the power structure like 15 like, times. Well, yeah, you figure so, that most things are like running off of the grid now that's on the internet. Yes, it, which is, uh, they're all running on very old code. 40 to 50 year old code. They've just been built on. They're easily able to be hacked. It's like, them. did you ever see the movie uh, Live Free or Die Hard? Cause, cause that is <laughs> that's a, a big no for me. Yeah, that's the that. premise of that, that <laughs> terrible movie. It was the fourth Die Hard movie, but that's the premise of it. This guy hacks into basically the grid because, and, and he's an American, and he's just trying to show them that they can easily be hacked, and he shuts everything down. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you sit there and you think about it, and that is like more of the reality of it. When I talk to my father about this, who's basically a, a pessimist, he's like, son, if it ever went down, we're all fucked. So whatever. But I'm like, I want to live. Right. You know, I want to be alive. So, so anyway, I mean, I think of it more in the terms of like the things that I do is like camping slash maybe something happens for a week. You get snowed in. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah. I don't want to come off like I'm some sort of crazy person that has like stockpiled 15 but years of food. If, all, if the power goes out and maybe this is what I'm doing. Maybe this is why I've been involved in publishing so long. Book money is going to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. People are buy people are buying books. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's what we're all investing in. Our podcast. <laughs> we'll need to put these podcasts on tape. Well, yeah. Or have transcripts, written yeah. transcripts. Yeah. Let's let's put them on tape. <laughs> <laughs> I need to start recording these on tape. I actually have a uh, I actually have a tape deck in my room, and I have a little microphone. I can just put it in the center of the That'd table. We can start yeah. releasing the Dictaphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People would be really into that. Yeah. If the power goes out. Right. It'll be like, in the future, it'll be like a literary mixtape. Oh, no, oh, <laughs> This is what it was like so before the, the lights went out. <laughs> do you feel like publishing is like... I feel like it's having a huge resurgence. I do, too. Yeah, okay. And I believe it's coming in a way that a lot of people are not happy about, and I think that's bullshit, and that's the audio thing. Yeah. I hate when people are all like, oh, that's not really reading. We it all, is. We take it's totally reading. Yeah, ways. yeah. I love like people I know who... like never would read and the next thing you know we're talking about some mystery book that they've been listening to in traffic and right. it's just like oh no 
wow, this is a whole new market. Yeah. No, I live whole in the new, suburbs oh. and like Audible is what gets me through. So I, mm-hmm. I still read. Yeah. I read a ton, but I also listen to books. So mm-hmm. I can read two books a week that way, and yeah. which is amazing. And I, I love it. And I think especially I, that's how I listen to, I listen to Lisa Cross Smith's book. Okay. Um, and tons of other books like that. Cause I just feel like it's my, I, I listen to podcasts or I listen mm-hmm. to books. Like I'm yeah. not going to, li- please. NPR was done for me during the election. I'm like, I don't need to hear everything that Donald Trump's doing because then I'm just like <laughs> traffic already makes you mad and like hearing, yeah, you know, hearing you political more. stuff just makes me crazy so yeah like I I don't listen to music usually when I drive mm-hmm. either but um, yeah so podcasts are podcasts I and audiobooks I mean but yeah you're totally right and it's fantastic the way people are getting into audio and it is and I think it, it really in, in general like I mean I just went to an author mm-hmm. dinner like Publishers are spending money on books still. They're printing tons of copies of beautiful books. I go to Book Expo mm-hmm. every year in New York, which is such a fun experience. And you when learn about that? it's in um, May every year, so it's like right after Memorial Day. I think sure. uh, Laura Relia is actually going to crash with me one night and come. But it's just this great. You learn all about the buzz for all the books for fall and oh. winter, and I've seen amazing people there and um yeah it's really fun the book business isn't going anywhere no, no. and i want people to it's <laughs> opening yeah. i mean audio is uh is opening people up to then start reading yeah but it's, i don't know why everyone's surprised are we are taking in mediums different right now our brains yeah. are changing there are book trailers have you seen book trailers oh, or yes. have you done yeah i just think that's so fun like like a mystery book has this like crazy cool trailer like a movie would have you're like oh i'm gonna read that book now because it looks it's such good. a smart way for marketing yeah. yeah i mean when we first started the podcast i mean matt really got on that about how he viewed this as just another way of this is just publishing. publishing. Podcasting right. yeah. is just another yeah. form of publishing. I mean, you're you're because it's just it's at the end of the day, it's all content. So, what content do you have available to you to build your brand right. or to sell whatever it is that you're selling? And working in marketing, that's one thing that we focus on with a lot of clients. It's like, what can you do? Can you get on? Can we do some videos with you? Can you write something? that we can turn into content for the website, a newsletter, a blog post, an article, you know, a white paper. Right. Can you talk? Can you create a podcast? You know, we're always looking because, and that's the cool thing about it is, is there's all these different avenues now. So why hate on, on one of them when it's basically serving the same purpose. But it's like people who are critical back to like when you were critical of people's music choices. Like if you judge the way people, the things that people read or then the way that people take in books, you know, a lot of like, that's like saying, so if you're visually impaired, you can't enjoy a book or if, you know, like it's just, that's bullshit. It's like reading is for everyone in whatever form it takes. Yeah. It's about what, how you take it in, not like the actual act itself. Right. Yeah. Well, I just I listened. I just finished the uh, the podcast this week. Atlanta Monster. Oh, my and, colleague Kalinda Lee was interviewed for that a lot. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I I got into uh, Payne Lindsay, who's the host. I got into his first podcast. Up and vanished. Up and vanished. I, well, true crime. I love yeah. That. Did you I love that you podcast. listen to that yeah. one too? Yeah. So I got into that one. I don't. I'm not even sure how I found out about it, but I. You know, I got into that one, listened to that one. And then when they were doing uh, Atlanta Monster, when I heard about it, my friend actually did some of the design work for it because she mm-hmm. works over at How Stuff Works. And I, I was excited. I mean, I knew about that thing like three, four months before it came out. So I was just sitting around like, come on, let's do this. And um, I think about it, though, because I was I had done some research on the Atlanta child murders probably like six or seven years ago. And I found it really fascinating. And there's all these different books. But... You know, I listen to basically 12. There's there's 10 full episodes and two bonus episodes. So I listened to 12 hours about this case. And it was rad because I could just do it. At your while, leisure. Yeah. 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 Doing, doing dishes, and, yeah. cleaning the house, and just hanging out. And I don't think that I would have gotten through all that information uh, if I had to read a book for 12 hours. Yeah. Because that's some pretty heady shit. Yeah, and know? I think having different voices present. So, I totally. mean, he, because he's white, I think him talking about these murders of African-American children 
if it had been a book written, I think it would have had a lot more criticism. I think the fact that he brought in so many different voices and he brought in, you know, media personalities of the time and historians and family members when applicable. Like, I think that that was yeah. really smart. Yeah. Yeah. He seems to be very conscious of like what he's doing yeah. and then even teaming up with how stuff works. I thought that they did a really good job of that. And one of the first episodes, I mean, I think the first episode, they really focus in on it being a racial issue. Yeah. And it was just very, and I don't know, it was really interesting. And uh, I, I feel like I learned a lot yeah. from listening to that podcast, especially being someone who lives in Atlanta and has been right. here for a long time and and realizing how that affects our community today, even, you know, and, and people might think, oh, well, that happened back in the late 70s, early 80s, but that shit's still happening. You know, maybe not the murders, but the way that that was handled. Well, the way that, that some people are disposable in our world. And mm-hmm. so you can just, if you're a prostitute or if you're a young black child, like your life doesn't mean as much as like a John Benet Ramsey yeah. who is super pretty, yeah. young little girl who, you know, ends up probably her parent killed her. You know, it's like yeah. these things that just, the way that that was sensationalized and yet these boys were murdered and there wasn't as much focus on it. And yeah. I think the last episode they went in and I'm not sure it might've been Monica Kaufman who was, I uh, love her. Yeah. She's she so was, great. is she still on the news here? I don't think so. I think she does like special segments. Yeah. Yeah. So she was around for a long time. I'm not sure if it was her or someone else, but they were just talking about like one of the final segments of the, the last episode. They were talking about like, you know, what was lost by these children being murdered and it was, you know, maybe they was going to be a scientist or a mm-hmm. writer or a musician or an athlete. And, and, um, it's, it never happened. You'll never know what, right. what could have been from these lives. And, and it's true. It's like, well, what you're talking about is like, these no one is disposable. You, you he, never know what's And yet happen. there's so many times like the AIDS epidemic, like how many artists, like actors and writers and directors were lost due to the AIDS epidemic and it was like they were gay men and they were doing it to themselves and yeah. you know, like that really it does. I think that anytime there's a loss like that where people became disposable, it is. It's a huge loss for our humanity and that got real deep real fast. No, it's no. <laughs> Hey, that's what Lit and Bruised is all about, <laughs> getting really deep really fast. No, it's it's true, and I think that I think that we're at, at a interesting point in history right now where these things are just very uh, you know, top of mind. Surface level. Yeah, yeah. Every, everybody's talking yeah. about them. Everybody's thinking about it. And it's hard. There are hard conversations that need to happen. And I value them. And and most of the time of what's coming into question now is like, you know, you know, cis white men. And I am a cis white man, but a cis white man. I'm a cis white man. But let's talk about these things. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's make it uncomfortable. And who cares? You know, because if it makes it better for everybody. Like, right. we need to be having these conversations regardless of who feels uncomfortable about it. Very few good things come from being comfortable. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. These things need to happen. And, it, and I... I it's it's interesting, but hey, and it's whatever. Let's talk about it, you know, because if it makes people, um, if it raises equality, then it has to happen. So, yeah. so I don't know. I, and I like that angle with the podcast too, mm-hmm. with with Atlanta Monster, which yeah. I did not see that coming. Yeah, I just thought we were going, hey, we're going to do a true crime podcast. But right. I, I like the fact that it brought it back to these lives. Issues. Yeah, and those in those young people who whose lives were cut short. Yeah, and yeah, like it. We don't focus enough, I think, on, especially with true crime on the victims, and it's all about the murderer and like the psycho, you know, psychological profile of that person. So I'm glad that they did that. Yeah, it is pretty. Uh, it is pretty messed up when you think about it. I yeah. mean, especially when they give these killers like these cool names. They're like, oh, it's the Golden Gate Killer, yeah. or the the Night Stalker, and yeah, you look at it and you're like. Wow, we're really glorifying yeah. the serial killer right, right now. That's pretty fucked up. But well, with that being said, well, hey, what's on the calendar for the Atlanta <laughs> History Center? <laughs> great segue. Right, yeah. great segue. Um, so we, I would say that this is sort of our year of food. Uh, this Thursday, well, this is not going to be 
no. broadcast. But um, a lot of great chefs like Virginia Willis is going to debut her new cookbook. We've got um, a really cool talk about women in the civil rights movement. I think a lot of men get the the credit for the civil rights movement. So that's happening in May that's at Margaret cool. Mitchell House. Um, some good fiction at Margaret Mitchell House is coming up. But yeah, I'm, we typically have five to six events every month between the History Center wow. and Margaret Mitchell House. So there's a lot. There's a, something for everybody everyone. Everybody get on that. Yeah, something for everyone. Well, how can people get on that? How they, can they find out? <laughs> AtlantaHistoryCenter.com and go to author programs and it has our full list of author programs. And is that posted on social media? As it well? is. Yeah. Facebook, Twitter, all of it. Okay. And we'll make sure we have that stuff on yeah. the, uh, yeah, we'll link it. Yeah. We'll link it on the page as well. I mean, I gotta be honest. I've known about this a little bit in passing from knowing you for the last 10, 12 months, but obviously been busy with some things. Um, but I thinking about it and that was another big, you know, uh, motivation for having you even on the show is just to know more about that and to let our audience know like, Hey, there's, there's some really rad literary stuff going on that you may not know about just because, you know, we, we live in that grassroots community and, um, a lot of this stuff is DIY, but there's a lot of cool people doing cool stuff in the city outside of our little bubble. So right. let's bridge that gap and let's, you know, let's show up to get, those events. Get out of your neighborhood a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely. only like 10 miles, if that, to Buckhead, even shorter to yeah. Midtown. So, oh, yeah. I mean, Margaret Mitchell House, that's the corner of Peachtree and 10th. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, I could ride my bike you there. You could. Yeah. I will ride my bike there. <laughs> and it's such a beautiful, I mean, especially Margaret Mitchell House, yeah. such a beautiful location. And then are most of these readings in the auditorium? On the yeah, they're in the, we have a small space that's just kind of like a blank space, almost like a black box theater. Yeah. yeah. So we can accommodate like 130 or something like that. Yeah. And they, they talk about their book. A lot of times they, they read just a short amount and they mostly just talk about their process and then they take, you know, questions and sell yeah, books cool. and sign them. Yeah. Yeah. Because when we came over to look at the space to do yes. the transgression there, you showed us that space first and I had no idea that even existed. So it's pretty cool. I mean, if you're not familiar with the uh, Margaret Mitchell house, there is, this a little building off the side there. That's an, it's it's very obvious if you know what you're looking right. at. But uh, I thought it was really cool. It was it's really it's just a really cool location in general, and you're just in the heart of Atlanta with it. it. Yeah, absolutely, so, yeah. Well, definitely. Well, we're gonna check that out. I know that Matt and I will be there. Oh, one question: the people that are doing cookbooks. Are they going to like have food there? Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. So um, Eddie Hernandez from Taqueria del Sol launch, is launching his book. Oh, so there'll cool. be food. Right. Virginia Willis is doing food. We're opening a barbecue exhibit at the History Center on May 5th. What? So if you're interested in barbecue and the history of barbecue, that'll be there. Oh my god! Yeah, there's a, there's yeah. cool stuff all the time. That yeah. sounds amazing. I mean, I've never had like been to a reading where like food was part of the oh, reading. Oh yeah. You know the Mailchimp readings you all have like it's it's catered. <laughs> like cheese and crackers or like Oh no. no, no. Oh. It's, it's, it's nice. Mailchimp has a lot of money. I love them. <laughs> mm-hmm. They they do mm-hmm. it right, man. They you do got, it right. It's like my favorite literary series. It's <laughs> just like all the good stuff. But uh well that's good to know though. Yeah. You're hungry. And I imagine if you ever do like a mixologist book, there might. Oh, be some- we did. We the Southern Foodways Alliance cocktail book. We had Jerry Slater, who used to be at H Harper Station, yeah. and he was. There was four different cocktails that they were serving. Yeah. Well, I'll, we do I'll, that I'll, stuff I'll make sure you have the right phone number for me this Perfect. time. Perfect. Do and that. You can just text me. <laughs> hey, free barbecue get a drink. and yeah. bourbon <laughs> tonight. So, but. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to plug or let us let our audience know about before we wrap it up tonight? I just think we there's a lot of things that we do that you wouldn't expect. So we do a, a series called Party with the Past, where we go to different locations throughout Atlanta, um, and it's a we call it free free history, cold beer because you have to pay for the beer, you have to yeah. pay for the alcohol. But we've gone to Fox Theater, we've gone to Auburn Avenue, we've gone all different locations throughout Atlanta, um, and just it's a f- totally free program, and people just show up and they learn a little bit about the history of that building or that space. Cool. Yeah, so that's. Part 
party with the past, which is cool. And I think your your listeners would be interested in that. And then we have a new series at Midtown called Hidden Midtown, where we're mm-hmm. telling some of the stories of Midtown. And so the next one is about the great speckled bird. Oh, which, wow. Yeah. Oh, so that's, that. yeah, that'll be really fun. Um, when is that? That is, it'll be past probably when this airs, but Thursday, next Thursday, the 19th. Um, oh and so God. it'll be people who are the writers from the great speckled bird and talking about kind of the history of that underground paper and or any yeah. of, is is any of that recorded or listed so we anywhere? don't do a ton of recordings um we've done like an lgbt hidden hidden midtown but what you do is there's a small scavenger hunt yeah. that people do and then they come back and there's like a big talk about that oh wow yeah. i actually did a lot of research on the great speckled oh, bird neat. uh probably five six years ago okay. because just I was writing for a, you know, uh, limelight paper, and I ended up having a conversation with somebody about the 60s and the counterculture movement in Midtown on, you know, from 8th to 14th Street, which a lot of people don't realize that's where all the kind of hippies hung out. I mean, Margaret Mitchell was like, our property was like the center of that, 10th and Beach Street, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, um, but yeah, just... You know, the the Great Speckled Bird, like their office was like firebombed by the FBI yeah. because they were saying shit that the FBI and the government didn't like. Yeah. I mean, I actually have a postcard on the side of my fridge that's a Great Speckled Bird postpart, postcard because I just found it so interesting and yeah. inspiring, you know, because they were the ones that really uh, paved the way for DIY media. Yeah. You know, and that's... I mean, how do you get more punk rock than that? I know. The FBI firebombs you. I mean, shit. And now is, they're they're in their seventies, and they'll be there next week. You that's amazing. So it's next. So it's next, <laughs> yeah, Thursday. next Thursday. That's amazing. I'll check that out. Definitely. Well, sorry about y'all who are just <laughs> hearing about this later on, but I'll I'll be there. So, but well, Kate, thank you so much for of being course, on the show it was tonight. Fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was great to hear your story and learn about. Uh, that you're obsessed with true crime and serial killers. Um, I'm going to tell your husband. Yeah. But uh, Matt, do you have any final words or anything that you'd like to add before we wrap up the show this evening? Don't die dumb. Good night, everyone.